Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Part of God's word for our special consideration this day is written for us in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter, verses 24 through 31. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor is a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If the master of the house was called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household. So do not be afraid of them, because there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed, and nothing hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the, fear the one who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a small coin? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground without the knowledge and consent of your father. And even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. This is the gospel of our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, worries, fears, Everyone seems to have them, and more and more all the time, right? But what use are they, and what good do they do any of us? Absolutely nothing, right? The, the survivor, a famous survivor of concentration camp, Corey Ten, Ten Boom, she said that worry doesn't ever empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It only empties today of its strength. That's a pretty wise saying. Someone who probably had a lot more to worry or fear about than any of us here. Someone else has said that worry is like a rocking chair. It'll give you something to do, but it doesn't ever get you anywhere. Robert Frost, great poet, right? Toward the end of his life, research, medical research was finding out how devastating worry can actually be to your physical health and body. And he said, well, I don't, I'm not really surprised at all that worry kills a lot more people than hard work does, because there's a lot more people that worry than people that work. And another wise person says you can't change the past for anything, but you sure can ruin a perfectly good present by worrying about the future. Now, all that I find to be very helpful, very wise, very sage advice, don't you? But is it enough to keep you from worrying or being afraid? No, we need a little more than that, right? All the stuff that we go through, all the evil out there in this sinful world, all the struggles and hardships that we and people we know have, we need something more than just some clever bunch of sayings like this. We're going to need something a lot stronger to be enough for us. Well, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, today comes to us and tells us something that is a lot stronger, something that really does work. As he tells us here in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, are not two sparrows sold for a small coin, a tenth of a drachma? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground without the knowledge and consent of your father. And even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. This is a direct command from your Lord and Savior, God, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a direct command of his and I would have to think this is kind of the main point of what he's talking about here and before and after. Because over and over, I keep seeing the same thing being repeated. Fear not. Have no fear, just kind of in a general way. But other times, don't ever be afraid of this. Don't ever start worrying about that. And here in the part today, he says, stop it. Knock it off. Stop worrying. Stop being afraid. Cut it out. Learn the lesson. Learn the lesson of the sparrows. And what's the lesson of the sparrows? <laughs> it's a dangerous world. But our God is in control. Yeah, it's a dangerous world. Sometimes sparrows do drop to the ground dead. Jesus doesn't pull this Pollyanna pie in the sky kind of church as this religious business model that says, hey, come join our club and it's going to be all just... just piece of cake and roses and tea and you're just going to have success all the time and all these great feelings all the time. Jesus doesn't say that. In fact, anyone who thinks he was saying that must have fallen asleep during the Sermon on the Mount. 
and during the entire ministry and teaching life of our Lord Jesus, and during the whole book of Romans, and through all the Old Testament, and the lives of the apostles, and, and, and. Anyone who teaches that, whether he believes it or not, he's a false prophet. A wolf in sheep's clothing, which, by the way, is exactly how Jesus started out this whole section of this talk. Talks about the false teachers. Saying it doesn't matter so much what God's word says. What matters is what, what you believe, what you think. And then he gets to verse 16. He says, look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. So be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. You're going to be up against it. There's going to be so many people that don't care about the truth of God's word, and there are going to be actually people who persecute you. You are going to have struggles. You are going to face difficulties. You are going to have people hate you. I don't want you to go looking for persecution. You're not supposed to be the ones to stir this up and start the conflicts. Remember he said, be wise and innocent. But those things are going to find you. You'll face difficulties. You will be persecuted. See, Jesus is not so dishonest or unloving or impractical as to sugarcoat this truth, to pull this, this gospel of success baloney, where it makes people treat the word of God so lightly that they think there's this way to find a different path to God. You can have the crown without the cross. The temptation the devil himself used on Jesus himself, right? Hey, just worship me for just one quick second, and then you can have all this. You can have all these treasures and pleasures and all this power and authority. All the kingdoms of the world will be yours, and you won't have to do all that terrible suffering and struggling and painful stuff. You will never have to get on that path that goes through struggles and ends at the cross. The same temptation, really, for us to find other ways to be okay with God? Or to think that there are some worldly treasures and pleasures that could be a decent end goal in and of themselves? And this stuff is not just impossible when it comes to the cross of Jesus, this fact that this holy, righteous God cannot have sin go unpunished. He cannot have his justice go unfulfilled. And since we sinners keep putting ourselves on the wrong side of God by our sins. Oh, no, we can't blame Adam and Eve for that. I know some people try to do that, right? It's Adam and Eve's fault. They fell into sin. That's why I'm a sinner. Well, maybe I'm not fully responsible for having been born in sin, but that debt that I start with there, maybe it's like the national debt, right? It's something that, if I'm honest, I have to say I keep contributing to and adding to every single day. And we all do. We are born in that debt of original sin. But we're the ones who keep adding to it with our selfishness and pride and lack of love and our dishonesty. That's why Jesus, Jesus, God the Son, the Son of God, he's the only one who could make that right. He's the only one who could pay that debt. And that means the cross. But even when it comes to the individual crosses that Jesus tells us we, his followers, we, his disciples are going to care, carry through our lives, those are unavoidable too. Yeah, they're different for each one of us. For some of us, there are certain people in our families, in, in our relationships, in our, in our work life, wherever it is, who, man, they don't treat me the way that I think they should treat me, and yet here's God still giving us these God-given roles in which we're supposed to live our lives. And here are his directions for love and what that means. And for some of us, the struggles, the crosses are more physical, right? They're more sufferings or sicknesses or, or pains of some kind. And, and for some of us, it's just the fact of living as imperfect people in an imperfect world. And all the temptations that go along and make me, me feel so vulnerable. And all my guilt that makes me feel so ashamed. Or maybe it is this out-and-out -out persecution that Jesus says a lot of his followers would be finding and should be expecting. After all, he says, isn't it kind of foolish to think that the servant, the slave, the follower, the student is going to have it better than the master, the teacher, the Lord? 
He says, actually, you guys should be thinking this completely differently. Isn't it neat if the follower can even have it as the master, as the Lord? Think, if we're persecuted for Jesus, what, what company you and I are getting to walk in, to be treated as Jesus was treated? That kind of, of persecution should actually be, that should be considered a privilege. Getting to walk in the highest company possible. So yes, yeah, Jesus points out and says point blank enough times in his holy word, in this world you will have trouble. Learn the lesson of the sparrows. Sparrows do drop to the ground. It's a rough world. But thank God that's not the end of the lesson, right? Sparrows drop to the ground. It's a dangerous world, but God is in control. God, who's a loving God and considers us to be very valuable people. Earlier, we listened to Jeremiah kind of complain a little bit about this strict message that God was sending him out with that, that made other people not like him so much and not treat him so well. But even Jeremiah had to come to the grasp that this unpopular message that God was sending him with, this was the message by which God was going to accomplish all his plans. This was the message by which God was also conveying all his promises. This is the message that made Jeremiah part of God's people and gave him forgiveness and eternal life. And then our second lesson, we had the Apostle Paul, and, and here he finds himself in another one of those near riot or maybe riot situations, right? Persecution, threats, violence, People on the inside, people on the outside. And yet, where does he start? That absolute truth, that absolute hope of the resurrection. He starts there, the resurrection, the Lord Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead. Yeah, the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself, who had to become one of us to live the life perfectly that we couldn't, and then make the payment that was enough for the guilt of everyone's sins. That resurrection of Jesus that proves God's okay with me. I'm okay with him. We'll have a resurrection of our bodies and an eternal life with him someday. We get to spend forever with the one who did all this for us and promise that to Jeremiah and to Paul and to us. That God, that God who knows everything, even when a little bird falls to the ground, nothing escapes the notice of our Heavenly Father. Not, not the demise of one of these seemingly insignificant little creatures. I don't think much about sparrows very often. God thinks about them way more often than I do. He is concerned with what we think are even the tiniest, little, most insignificant, most worthless little details. He says, take the hairs of the human head, for example, which the average person, I'm told, has 125,000. Some of us more, some of us fewer. And every single day, we're losing, and hopefully regrowing and regaining, replacing hundreds of these each day. And yet, at any particular point in time, our God knows not only exactly how many there are, but exactly where they are. If he knows that, I mean, God knows where and how many each of our hairs are. Are any of us even worried or concerned about that? If he knows that, he certainly knows whatever other needs and real concerns we have. If no little bird drops to the ground without his consent, he certainly knows what's going on with us and cares what's going on with us, and he'll take care of any of our needs. We're certainly more to him, worth more to him, even if he didn't tell us here that we're worth more than many of these birds. Think how valuable we are to him that he gave his one and only son to die for us, to give us life with him. Just think what that means. This almighty God who knows everything, cares about everything, knows enough about everything to control even what happens with these worthless little birds, how much more won't he take care of us for whom he sent his one and only son to die for people who were his enemies by nature? If he did that, I mean, this is action. This isn't just some wise sage advice or some nice words. This is action. He did what it takes. He did everything it takes. And then he says, if, if the birds don't worry, why do you? When my kids were little, we put out a, a tire swing in the backyard. I hung on a nice big giant rope. 
And of course, after I got it all ready, I tested it with my 200 and, uh, pounds uh, of weight and swinging out to the extreme end as, as far as I could on each. So we knew, okay, if it can hold me, obviously these little 30 and 40, year pound, 40 pound tights could easily get on there, even several at a time. And it's going to be okay with them. The one who created life certainly can sustain and take care of our lives. The one who formed each one of our individual bodies certainly knows our needs and will take care of them. The one who took care of our biggest problem, sin, by the most extreme thing it took to take care of that problem, he certainly will take care of everything else. Everything else is a piece of cake compared to that. If he kept his promise of having his son die for us, what promise is he not going to keep? And for us who know that, who have that forgiveness, that assurance of eternal life, then what could possibly make us afraid or worried? We don't have anything to worry about, ever. We might not be able to figure out the how of how he's going to get this promise accomplished where he says he works all things, even the bad things, for our eventual best, but we know he's going to. How he does it, that's his concern, not mine. I have to admit that a long time ago, Teresa and I sometimes... We're not discreet enough with our conversations about some of our financial concerns. Once in a while, the kids would overhear. And then you got these little tykes, and they're all worried, and they're bringing in their banks with their pennies and nickels like they're going to help us out, right? Well, come on, get out of here, kids. This is not your concern, right? Go, be kids. What does God say? That's not your concern, he says. That'll be my concern. Get out of here, you're kids. You're his children made that way by his son, saved by Jesus' perfect life and invaluable death. Of course, get out of here. You don't have to worry about it. God will take care of that. And he doesn't even need our advice or our help to do it. Imagine that. He doesn't need our pennies or nickels to bail us out. He doesn't even really need a reason for anything he does. He's God. And yet, as gracious and kind as he is, he still gives us a reason. And he lets us know it. His reason is to work out everything in his plan for our eternal best according to his good and perfect, always right plans with everything that happens. And if you know that, doesn't that make you think even a little differently about some of the rough stuff that comes up in our lives? Do you know that golf balls didn't originally have all those little dimples on them? For centuries, they were completely smooth. People started to realize that it was hard to control those completely smooth golf balls with a completely smooth cover. It was, I mean, you think you have a bad hook and slice now. These things just go wherever they want. And they don't go nearly as far either. But some people trying to get a little edge, trying to get a little advantage, started recognizing, hey, the ones that got a little cracked on the side, that got roughed up here, got a little pitted by hitting that rock, those were a little easier to control and flew a little farther. And pretty soon, people are hitting with little hammers and little rocks to get all these little dents in their golf balls. Well, eventually, of course, they realize exactly how many of those little dents and how big would be perfect to make them fly the furthest. That's what happens in your life, in our lives as God's people. He knows that there's certain rough things in our lives that make us fly even further and straighter. Now, God doesn't need a, a wind tunnel or a supercomputer simulation to tell how many dimples and how deep to put in our golf balls. He just knows. He knows everything. And that's why we don't have to worry. He knows what it takes, and he does everything it takes. We don't have to worry about anything. We don't have to be afraid of anything. We just have to remember the lesson of the sparrows. It's a rough world, but our God is in control. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having listened to the word of our holy God, we now join in declaring the faith he's given us. We do that this morning using the words of the Nicene Creed. Would you please stand? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. 
For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. 